getting very much back onto uh, a time uh, track. Uh, the next presentation is uh, one um, of our um, own people here. It's by Holly uh, Freefeld. She uh, is a part of um, uh, what we've been doing for the last uh, 10 years, is uh, uh, having a New Zealand-Hawaii exchange program run. And uh, so she uh, was uh, awarded uh, to go down to New Zealand uh, this past year, and uh, so uh, she, uh, we've given her opportunity to, to give a presentation on her findings from that um, work. The New Zealand Exchange Program operates through the uh, Landcare Research um, Institute down in New Zealand and um, between the Alliance. And uh, the, this presentation and the next one will, is, is uh, part of that uh, development. So uh, Holly is, uh, work, currently works for the Fish and Wildlife Service based in Honolulu, uh, the Vertebrate Recovery Coordinator for Hawaii and the US Pacific Islands. Uh, she has a PhD from the University of Oregon and studies seabirds in Northwest Hawaiian Islands and forest birds in American Samoa and has worked and traveled widely in the Pacific. I'd like to uh, bring to the uh, podium Holly Freefeld. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Aloha. New Zealanders have many of the same conservation issues to tackle that we do. Island fauna, typically naive of terrestrial predators, a rich and abundant community of alien species, and high rates of extinction and extirpation of native species. It's not news to anyone in this room that ground and burrow nesting birds are especially vulnerable to predators, and many in New Zealand are largely restricted to offshore islands and other protected areas. Translocation is a tool that's been used often and with good results in New Zealand for the recovery and restoration of seabirds. In January, I assisted with the translocation on an island off of Wellington, and today I'd like to tell you about what I did, what I learned, and share some ideas about how we might apply these translocation techniques to benefit Hawaiian seabirds. As Chris described, my trip was supported by a grant from the Pacific Hawaii Conservation Exchange Program. And uh, the purpose of this program is to enhance information exchange between Hawaiian and New Zealand conservation communities, which share many concerns and challenges. The objectives of my trip were to learn firsthand about New Zealand translocation techniques and variables that influence their success through direct participation and discussion with New Zealand seabird conservation experts, and to try to generate some ideas for adapting and applying these methods for use in Hawaii. <clears throat> Translocation typically is used to address two overarching objectives, to improve the status of endangered species through the establishment or enhancing of populations in places where threats don't occur or can be managed, and or rebuilding communities to restore ecosystem functions. Translocations have been conducted around the world on many seabird species and for a range of reasons. For example, the, the status of species or their, or their habitats, the time frame required for achieving results, to facilitate research, and to employ common species to work out methods for rare ones. 
The tube nose, or proslurid seabirds, petrels, shearwaters, albatrosses, and, and their allies, are especially amenable because they have very high rates of phylopatry or bonds to the sites that they fledge from, and because many species nest in burrows, which facilitates the confinement and care of chicks prior to fledging. Seabirds are essentially marine animals, and they face considerable threats when they come to land to breed. Alien predators and habitat loss are the principal threats to nesting seabirds and the overwhelming cause of their extinctions and extirpations worldwide. Ideally, we'd like to remove predators and other threats from seabird nesting habitat, and there are new, numerous small islands uh, and habitat islands where this has been done. However, as we know, on large islands or in continental environments, the challenges and cost of removing predators and ungulates and invasive plants and restoring native habitats are so daunting that needed landscape scale management seldom happens. Until we figure out how to make it happen, creating colonies of seabirds in places that are safe or that can be made safe, especially on high islands, is an excellent alternative. Translocation isn't the only method to accomplish this. There are a variety of means depending upon what you, what you want to accomplish and how fast you want to do it. You can create safe habitat and hope the birds come. You can employ various social attraction techniques, uh, combinations of playbacks and decoys and artificial burrows. And you can use a combination of some of those methods and, and translocation. We have, in fact, experimented with a number of these kinds of, of techniques in Hawaii, and here are a few examples of translocation and social attraction projects here, including a few for seabirds. Note that creating a new seabird colony in Hawaii by moving chicks hasn't yet been attempted, as it has with uh, lay sand ducks, don't miss Michelle Reynolds' talk uh, tomorrow, and, uh, and Palila, there's a poster by Chris Farmer and Company about that. So, why New Zealand? Um, they have undertaken translocation projects for six species of shearwaters and petrels, and there are two more projects in the, in the planning phase now. Most of these species are closely related to Hawaiian species, including our, th our threatened newel shearwater and endangered Hawaiian petrel. Translocations in New Zealand have taken pl place under a, a host of logistical conditions and have provided opportunities to hammer out the most uh, e efficient and necessity-driven methods to maximize the success. And finally, several of these projects in New Zealand have in, in fact resulted in nascent breeding colonies at the release sites. I went to Mana Island, it's about 540-acre island that lies a mile and a half off the coast of the North Island outside of Wellington. The last cattle and sheep were removed from Mana in the early 1980s, and the New Zealand Department of Conservation took over management of the island in 1987 and began restoration work, including the removal of, of mice, from the last non-human mammals from the island. One of the really neat things about, about MANA is the Friends of, of MANA Island, which is a, a nonprofit community conservation group that was formed to help implement the Department of Conservation's uh, intensive management uh, restoration plan for the island. This group has propagated and outplanted something like a million native plants, and they've helped monitor the endangered species that have been translocated to MANA. Some of these are the North Island robin, the yellow crown, parakeet or kakariki, the Takahe and the gold striped gecko. Three seabird species have been translocated to Mana, the common diving petrel, the fairy prion, and the fluttering shearwater. But I should note that these translocations were undertaken for uh, ecosystem restoration rather than for restoration of endangered species because all three of these species have the capacity to form very large colonies and to help restore the influx of, of marine nutrients to this terrestrial ecosystem. I helped with um, the second of a three-year project to translocate fluttering shearwaters to Mana. I want to give you a quick rundown of, of what I did, the events and the results, and then talk a little more generally about what I learned and some of the potential applications in Hawaii. I assisted Friends of Mana Island with every aspect of the project. Before the chicks arrived, we tidied up the artificial colony and padded each of the 100 artificial burrows with dry grass, and we installed gates over the exit tunnels to keep the chicks from wandering out during the first few days on the island. 
The Shearwater Chicks came to Mana the next day after a 50 mile trip across the Cook Strait from Long Island where the source colony is. It was, uh, it was a pretty dramatic arrival uh, in two bright red helicopters that we watched come in over the water. And uh, everyone, including the chopper pilots, helped ferry all the, all the boxes, each of which contained two chicks, from the landing zone to the uh, field camper near the artificial colony. Once uh, the chicks had been formally welcomed to the island by representatives of the local Maori tribe, we um, checked all their bands, we gave them each a dose of water, and uh, we installed them in their, in their artificial burrows <clears throat> that, that same evening. And then we settled into a regimen of feeding the chicks every day. I was there for 10 days until January 14th, but the last chick didn't fledge until, until February 10th. In addition to feeding, uh, we closely monitored the chicks' weight and their growth. General protocols have been developed for feeding um, for each species, but these are adjusted to account for individual variation in size and, and growth rates. So uh, every aspect of the feeding and monitoring of these chicks was very carefully detailed and laid out, but modified as needed to ensure clean conditions for keeping the birds healthy and to ensure that they gained weight slowly and steadily and reached a, a target weight by the time their wings had reached uh, fledging length. The gate removal from each burrow was timed to ensure that each chick had an adequate emergence period to establish a, a bond with um, the new colony before they fledged, but not so soon that they would wander off and starve. So for starters, all we really have um, to go on now are how many of the chicks fledged and what kind of shape they were in when they left the island. 89% are presumed to have fledged successfully, which in this case means they had sufficient weight to survive and they had sufficient time on mana, hopefully, to maximize their likelihood of returning to the colony and to breed. Now, the ultimate results we, we won't have for maybe four to six years, which is the period of time that young fluttering shearwaters spend at sea before they return to prospect and then to breed. So uh, annual monitoring of the artificial colony is really important to detect these first tentative explorations by birds that are, that are thinking about nesting. So generally, the diversity of seabird translocations in New Zealand has led to the development of detailed methods to account for various working conditions and seabird life histories. Although flexibility and improvisation have played an important role, some enduring considerations for planning have emerged. The remoteness from veterinary and other assistance, access to infrastructure such as water, electricity, refrigeration, the distance from the source colony to the translocation site, and weather, prevailing winds, and the physiological needs of the chicks have a huge impact on the methods and resources that are used. For example, the construction of artificial burrows and colonies and the materials used for that, the number of birds and people involved, the type of food that's fed to the chicks and how and when to prepare it, and protocols for keeping the whole procedure as sterile as, as possible and the many products that are used to, to accomplish that. And of course, the level of funding needed to pull the whole thing off. <clears throat> for translocation to be successful, a good understanding of species biology is, is needed, including the size, the frequency, and the seasonal pattern in the meals that are delivered to chicks by adult birds, the growth rates of chicks, their emergence period before they fledge, the average weight and wing length of fledglings, and a recognition that every bird is, is different. Knowledge of these traits informs the development of release criteria and a feeding regime that ensure good weight and health, that is the likeliness of their survival, and maximize the chicks imprinting on the release site, the likelihood of their return. Careful consideration of these variables, as well as innovation, is essential in developing translocation methods for Hawaiian seabirds. We know that the main Hawaiian islands once harbored a diverse seabird community, some species literally covering the islands, and this component of our terrestrial ecosystem 
has been dwindling since uh, human settlement. And we also know that over the next century, high islands will become increasingly important places to restore and protect habitat for seabirds as low coral and islets disappear under rising seas. So the time is now to start uh, restoring seabirds in the main Hawaiian islands. And the place, at least for starters, could be Kaina Point. Uh, which could be the site of Hawaii's first predator-proof fence, and there's a, a poster about this project as well. There's great potential to make Kaina Point a, a large, teeming seabird colony with a diversity of species like uh, Kilauea Point on Kauai. It already has a large colony of wedge-tailed shearwaters and a growing colony of laysan albatrosses. Black-footed albatrosses have been observed checking the place out. And uh, once it's fenced and cleared of predators, other species may turn up on their own, or we could help them out with a combination of social attraction and translocation and give ourselves the opportunity to experiment with these techniques and refine them for our species and circumstances. Other locations in the main Hawaiian Islands and their offshore islets provide similar opportunities. For example, imagine the seabird colony that Koho'olawe could support once the mammals have been removed. Our two listed seabirds, the Hawaiian petrel and Newell shearwater, nest in remote montane locations where they're at risk from predation by mammals and barn owls and from habitat, habitat degradation by ungulates and invasive plants. Of course, our ultimate goal is to address these threats and protect and recover these species in situ, but implementing colony-based conservation projects for seabirds has proven extremely difficult for several reasons. We currently lack experience, plans, and permits for large-scale predator control in wet montane Hawaii. Logistical, political, and economic challenges surround the construction of extensive fences and the removal of ungulates from public land and the use of toxicants to control predators on a landscape scale. We've got to overcome these obstacles for all endangered species and native biota in Hawaii. But while we figure out how to do that, Translocation and social attraction may provide the means to establish seabird colonies for now in places where we can protect them. Creating new colonies also can be the means to rescue some small dwindling populations in situations where fencing and threat control may not be feasible or desirable in situ, such as the case uh, it, for the Hawaiian petrel on Mauna Loa. Colony creation also can provide opportunities for mitigation under the Endangered Species Act that can be measured and monitored relatively easily. These birds are difficult to get to and to study, and accessible, protected colonies can give us excellent opportunities to monitor these species very closely and fill significant gaps in our knowledge. Look how much we've learned from Brenda Zahn's monitoring of two pairs of Newell shearwaters at Kilauea Point. We lack specific knowledge of how breeding biology and phenology vary among islands and habitats, and we lack knowledge of demography, annual survival, and reproduction at a scale that would help us connect vital rates to population trends, and to understand relationships between reproduction, population dynamics, and marine resources especially as the abundance and distribution of these resources respond to changing oceanographic conditions over the coming decades and other human impacts on, on ocean ecosystems. Again, the restoration uh, through predator-proof fencing and clearing of offshore islets um, can provide locations for establishing colonies of our endangered seabirds. Lehua Islet off Ni'ihau is now rabbit-free, and within the next year or two, it will be rat-free as well. And uh, it does harbor small populations of both Newell shearwaters and band rump storm petrels, as well as many other seabird species. We hope that uh, the Newell shearwater and band rump storm petrel will rebound on their own in the absence of rats, but we should keep in mind our ability to give them a helping hand here and elsewhere. I'd just like to offer a brief um, final observation of a more general nature. How many people in the room have been to New Zealand or know at least one person who has? So most of us then have experienced or heard about the extraordinary conservation work there and the widespread awareness of conservation issues. While I was on Mana and subsequently meeting with people and traveling around the country with my husband, I was deeply impressed by how knowledgeable how many New Zealanders are about their natural world, the threats it faces, and what is being done and what has to be done to address those threats. 
Granted, conservation biologists in New Zealand are working under conditions that are somewhat dif different than ours, but their proactive, energetic, creative, and fearless approach and the results that approach has produced are a huge inspiration and an example for us and others struggling to protect native island biota and ecosystems. However, lest we all become discouraged by how far ahead New Zealand is and how very far we still have to go, I can tell you that I, I, I learned they don't, ha they don't have it all figured out down there and they're still faced with many challenging questions. For example, they're still working on methods for telling their boots apart. <laughs> Thank you. one of the things that makes um, seabird species and species like shearwaters uh, so good for doing this is that, yeah, you handle them a lot before they fledge, but once they fledge, they're out of there for, for four or five years. They're at sea. They're associating only with uh, other seabirds, and uh, so far that hasn't proved to be an impediment, at least as far as anyone's been able to measure.